of Colossians. We've been teaching on, you know, faith foundations. Uh, we, we gave our, I'll just give you the references. Habakkuk 2.4, behold his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith, or his faith. Romans 1.17, uh, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10.38, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So we, those are our faith foundation scriptures that the just shall live by faith. We've been talking about different aspects. Uh, how do we get faith? What is faith? Uh, head faith versus heart faith. Faith versus hope. Hope faith sees the answer, sir. Faith versus feelings. Uh, faith for healing. What does it mean, mean to believe with the heart? Faith for prosperity. And now last week, a couple of weeks, we've been talking about the seven steps to the highest kind of faith. And we took for two Wednesday nights to talk about the integrity of God's Word. And so, I believe we've covered that uh, sufficiently for this teaching. Uh, the integrity of God's Word is paramount to having faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Word of God. <clears throat> so, um, and in a time and day and era when people are assailing the Word of God as, or the written Word is being important, we must understand that the integrity of the Word of God is, of, um, is paramount. It is, it is crucial it is the foundation. It is the cornerstone of being able to have Bible faith. All right. So let's go to our second point of the, the, the second step to the highest kind of faith is, uh, is the revelation of our redemption in Christ. In other words, we establish first of all the integrity of God's Word. Why? Because then everything else is based on what the Word says. And once there is a revelation or a, 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 an acceptance, a revelation an acknowledgement of and a practicing of uh, implementing the Word of God and the integrity of God's Word in our life, then we can build these other things on that. Um, if you just kind of take the Bible as a book of, of, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Good guidelines, good ideas, that kind of thing. Then you can pick and choose and take and leave and do as you want. And, um, and then these other things become mute points because you can always go, ah, I don't believe that's really accurate. Like one preacher said one time, oh, you won't find that when I'm teaching in that thing. I'm out beyond that. Well, when you start calling the Bible that thing and you're out beyond it, you're, 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 you're way out beyond where I need to be. And I, and I'm, and I ever would dare to go. Amen. But let's, so let's talk, talk about it. Now, we, we know that the integrity of God's Word is true. So now let's, from that position, let's talk about the fact that our redemption in Christ. You have to have a, a revelation of our redemption in Christ. Jesus' blood is the basis of our victory. Now, remember the old covenant, when they, they finished with the Word of God, Moses gave the law, they took hyssop and wool and, and, and dipped it in blood and sprinkled it in all the law. Amen? To seal that as a blood covenant. Jesus' blood has been placed on our covenant, praise God. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 1, look over there with me if you will, which is where I told you to go earlier if you were listening, you would already be there. If I was listening to myself, I'd already be there. Colossians chapter 1, we'll start reading in uh, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with all the knowledge, or filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, hallelujah, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or accepted to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption. Here I say we have redemption. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So we have redemption. Now understand this, that there are times, um, there are things that are written in the Bible that are used in past tense. Like we have redemption. We have, we have redemption. In other words, it's already been done, but we have to accept it by faith. 
Just because you know, Jesus went to the cross and died for all mankind, but if you don't accept him as Lord, you don't get the benefit of it. And this is some of the problem with some of, with some of the things that people are teaching in, in, in some of the radical positions they take uh, of the grace of God. Because they start moving in that direction. And, and I'm not just hammering on that. But I'm just talking about when you, and listen, really some of the stuff they do, they're doing with the grace of God right now, they did with righteousness 20 years ago. I mean, really some of the exact same teachings. They were just called, oh, I'm right. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. It doesn't matter. I can't, lose. you know, and they went off on those same extremes. And so, but they was under the position of I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Now it's because we're under grace and they're teaching the same things. So, uh, understand that there are things that are settled as far as heaven's side of doing it. Heaven doing anything about it. When, when somebody needs to get saved, Jesus does not come back to the earth, get on the cross, die on the cross, shed his blood, die, go to hell, pay the price, raise up from the morning again, take it back up to heaven, see that right hand for the Father every single time somebody needs to get saved. That's already been done. And as far as God is concerned, here's, you understand, God's, God's view of the completeness of what he's done is so strong that the Bible refers to people whose names have not been blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. As far as he's concerned, he's done everything to save everybody that ever will, ever will live and need to be saved, which is everybody. It's when they die without Jesus, they get blotted out. Because they didn't accept what was available. Okay? Well, that's strong. But if you take that the wrong way and start teaching everybody saved, everybody's, you know, no, 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 no. As far as God is concerned and as far as heaven is concerned, he's done all he's going to do about it. But if you don't do your part, you get blotted out. You still have the manward side. And some of these things we were teaching back under, under righteousness, we talked right along these same lines. You know, uh, I can't lose my salvation. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. It doesn't matter what I do. I don't lose my, my, my place with the Father, da 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 da, da. Exact same stuff. So, but let's understand that when, like, you know, who, who hath redeemed us. It's already been done. You're not going to, listen, when you, you know, we, when, when you accept his redemption, it did, it, God didn't go out and redeem you at that moment. It was already provided for, made available. You just cashed it in, so to speak. Does that make sense? How many, ever, how many remember S and H ring stamps? Yeah. You used to get little books, and you go to, and you had grocery stores that had the big, big stamp out in front of them, you know, that, you know, they, 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 you, they gave you them, and then you could take them and get them what? Redeemed. Redeemed. Well, what happens when you redeem something? You cash it in. See, we have redemption, and you kind of said, when you got your book full, you had the redemption, but you had to cash it in. It had to be, you could have a full book. I remember we, we'd sit there with the little book, look through the book, and see how many, and we'd count the pages of how much stuff we had. All right? I, I don't remember what groceries were. A&P used to do them. Who? Big Bear. Never heard of Big uh, Down where I was, I guess Piggly Wiggly or, or IGA grocery stores used to do them. Big Bear. Never heard of a Big Bear grocery store. Down in Ashford. Okay. Yep. But I remember, you know, we used to shop at AMP, the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. And uh, you could get s &H green stamps. We'd, fill up, we'd look at all the stuff we were going to get. Oh, they're only 2,680 points. And it was going to take you 20 years to get them. But, you know. That's okay. We were, we were dreaming. It's like being on the old, um, old um, Wheel of Fortune. Remember you used to get, how many remember the way it used to be? Back in the early days where you would win $5,000, but you had to cash it in on junk on the show. And that, that sofa sleeper cost you $20,000. Y'all remember those days? You didn't actually get money. You had to take home the stuff. How many remember watching Wheel of Fortune back then? Debbie, you never watched it that far back? It was a daytime show back then. Carrie, you were shaking your head. You used to watch it back then? Yeah. It was, it was, it was daytime back then. You had, to, you had to buy whatever they had on the show, and it was overpriced, and it was, it was, it was just, because that's where they got the money from, was from the sponsors giving the stuff. All right. So it was the suggested retail value, which was out the roof. Has nothing, well, you had to redeem it. Okay? Jesus has purchased, you know what it says here, who have delivered, uh, um, in verse 14, in whom, we ha in whom we have 
redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, that takes place when we cash it in. You cash it in by faith. You cash it in by accepting what he's done. Can you say amen? Our redemption in Christ is based on the fact that Jesus' blood has, has, been a, has, has been shed. Jesus' blood has made the provision. Jesus' blood has paid the cost. You just have to cash it in. Now, um, Pastor Appreciation Day a year and a half ago, somebody gave us uh, something to uh, a coupon to get our car washed. They they're, have a relative who does car detailing. I still have it. My Jeep is still dirty. Now, according to that, I have the right to a clean Jeep. I have the right to a detailed, clean, I mean, interior, uh, leather, wheels, outside detailed I have a right because it's been purchased and paid for but guess what I got I got a dirty Jeep why because I haven't cashed in my redemption card it was paid for we, and I'm embarrassed to say it, it's, one of those, it's just kind of one of those issues, it's just been a coordinating a time thing to, to do it and just, you know, you get busy and never get it done. Hallelujah. Nathan probably wishes I could get it done by Friday because he wants to drive the Jeep to Junior Senior. He didn't want to drive Betsy. That's what he calls his car, Betsy. Hallelujah. If we cash in the redemption we have, we can have the benefit. You know, there's a lot of stuff in here that people have never cashed in. There's a lot of things in here we've never taken advantage of. And I, I know I'm using terminology that some people could get offended about. And I don't mean to be offensive by saying cashing it in. But I'm trying to use an allegory to so we, the things we can relate to and understand. If we do not take advantage of what Jesus paid the price for, we will not walk in the benefit of it. And see, if we're going to walk in the higher faith, we're going to have to start taking advantage of the reality of our redemption, who we are in Christ. Um, what it, what it means to us to have been redeemed. Amen. The, the authority that comes with being redeemed. His blood paid the price. It's already paid for. It's already there. But we have to take advantage of it. Amen. Are you here? You're going home. Amen. All right. So, he says in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Praise God. Ron. Yep. Okay. So we have, you know, we, we do, and we, we have, we have a redemptive account to, to cash in from, but if we don't do it, if we don't take advantage of it, if we kind of go through life going, well, you know, I'm a Christian and I'm going to heaven, uh, you're never going to walk in a high faith if you don't start taking and appropriating what God's Word says. Peter says something really interesting. He says, wherefore given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. And so we have to understand that there is provision made for us to partake. But if you're going to walk in that high kind of faith, you're going to have to start having an, an understanding that there is a redemption for you that has already been paid, and it's by the blood of Jesus. You know, listen, when we start talking about uh, works, you know, James and Paul did not, were not at each other's throat over works. Paul and James disagreed. No, they didn't. One was in reference to the works of the law. One was in, in reference to corresponding actions of your faith. James's terminology about works is in reference to actions that corresponded to faith. Paul's was saying, basing what you do on the works of the law. In other words, um, well, if I do penance, you know, or not even penance, if I go and offer a sacrificial, sacrificial lamb this week, then I can get something from God. That was the works of the law. If I kept the law, if I didn't walk two miles on the Sabbath, if I didn't do this on the Sabbath, if yada, yada, yada. And, and, and so Paul was, was coming against doing the works of the law, thinking you're going to receive things because of the works of the law. 
principles. They were basing their relationship with God on whether or not they fulfilled all the rules of the law. And Paul was very strong against that. But yet Paul did teach us that we're supposed to do certain things, where that, that, our, that the way we live should be, should be, we should be living a certain way, conducting ourselves a certain way, doing certain things. Those are actions that correspond to your faith. Okay, and that's what James, James says, show me your faith by your works, I'll show you my, I mean, um, show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Or in other words, my actions have a corresponding, or a corresponding result of my faith. Okay, when you understand that redemption is on the blood of Jesus, you're not approaching God saying, like um, uh, a number of years ago, if you'll go back and listen to some of Dad Hagen's old, old teaching, there's this woman in the line, he's going down the line praying for folks, she needed healing. And then there's another woman in the line who was, was, back, was, was like a, a roller coaster backsliding Christian. She'd be in church this week, get saved, or not saved, but get right with the Lord, serve the Lord a couple weeks, a couple months, whatever, backslide, be out for three or four months. Then come back to the altar and, you know, and get, get right with God again. You know, not saved again, but get right with God again, get back in relationship, fellowship, and so forth. And, you know, in two, two three weeks, two, three months, whatever, backslide again. The other woman, spiritual walked in the church, loved the Lord, flowed in the gifts of the Spirit. He's going down the healing line. And the woman that's, that's the, the once in the church all the time and spiritual says, now, Lord, you know I'm the best Christian in the church. See, she came based on her works to get something from God. Didn't get healed. <clears throat> Why? Because her healing wasn't based on her best Christian in the church. It was based on the blood of Jesus and his redemptive work. The other woman got to her and she said, Lord, I'm just throwing myself on your mercy. You know, you know, I just, I just, I just beg, I just plead for your healing mercy. And she got healed. Now, some of the family members of the woman who was the best Christian in the church got upset. How come God to heal that woman? You know, basically center woman, because she couldn't stay right two, three months in a row at a time. And here's mama, she's the best Christian. And he said, yeah, I agree with him. Best Christian, most spiritual, walking things of the Spirit. She came the wrong way. Your redemption is based on the blood of Jesus. And that is a revelation you have to have to have, high, to have faith. Why? Because you can't earn it. Yeah. You cannot earn your car, your house, your healing, your prosperity, your blessing. You don't earn them. There's not a, there's not a scale system of, okay, Brother Bill's confessed 5,238 times, and that's enough to tip the scales in his favor to get what he wants. Okay, or Debbie made 45 shoe boxes this year, so she gets healed. It, that, that, no, no, no. It is based on the blood of Jesus, and we come in faith and appropriate it by faith. Amen. That doesn't mean we don't go out and live right. Okay? Sin will thwart the blessings of God. They are an inhibitor. Sin is an inhibitor. Paul writes in the book of Hebrews, he said, sin besets us. It puts you off track, get you off course. So if sin besets you, it besets you. Let us lay aside the weights and the sins that do so easily beset us. Well, there's no way around that. That, that means it gets you, out of, it gets you out, of, out of course, off course, off direct, misdirected, not walking where you're supposed to be walking, not walking in the blessings. All right. So, redemption of Christ is based on his blood. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Let's back up a little bit. Uh, I can't read the whole chapter, but um, verse 14. God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. Know ye not that your, your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. And he did not say here that grace will let you do it and get away with it. Right. What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? Not, that, not one spirit, but one body. For the two saith he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. He didn't say lay around and just say I'm look at the finished work of Jesus and you won't fornicate. He said flee it. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? 
Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. We're redeemed. We're purchased. We're, on, we, we were, we're the purchased possession of Christ. But we're supposed to do certain, th certain things. With it. It's based on the blood. It's based on the power he's given us. But I'm telling you, he says, don't fornicate. People, people say, Paul's a preacher of grace. And, and, uh, and uh, it says, Paul's a preacher of grace. And just look at the finished work of Jesus. Well, Paul, the preacher of grace, said, don't fornicate. Yeah. But I say, he said, flee it. He said, as a matter of fact, he goes on back, up back here for earlier and basically says that if you're fornicating, you're making your body, and you're, you're, you're taking a member of Christ and making it a member of a harlot. I then, so shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. That's pretty strong language. I guess the Secret Service should have read this passage. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, me. Are y'all here? You're going home. Hallelujah. This couldn't, this kind of, that kind of came out. Some of y'all must be reading the papers. Hallelujah. We are bought with a price. What, what's the price? His blood was shed. His blood was shed. We just read that. His blood was shed to redeem us. Then watch how you handle your body. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Y'all hear you gone home. I, I had a pastor that uh, I know. Had a couple come in. I've said this, but if you haven't heard this, you need to hear this. Had a couple come in. Call them up and say, we need, we need uh, counseling on our relationship. Okay. Going to the church, you know. They come in. They get to talking. And he kind of figures out from the way they're talking, are you two living together? They said, yeah. Well, he said, that might be why you're having problems in your relationship. You're living in sin. Oh, they said, oh, no, we're under grace. That don't matter. Paul said to flee fornication. Preacher of grace, though, by the way. Flee it. He said, well, I think you'd probably be better off at a different church if you can't take this counsel. You can go find you a church you can go to, and it's okay to fornicate and get away with it. And there's a lot of churches. Yeah, well, I mean, look, you, you got homo churches. You got, you got ch churches that say they're, they're homosexuals. And they're, well, that's, that's, that's fornication, that's sexual perversion and sin. And, and they actually advertise, you know, they're for the homosexuals. They all come in and they worship the Lord as homosexual. You can't do that. Of course, their, their, their point is that the laws of the land won't let them marry and so forth. Well, that's because the laws of the land are based on the Word of God. Or were until a bunch of radical, demon possessed, demonized idiots started getting a hold of everything. And I would better leave that alone. And going right on over to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's run over there. That's safer over there because I'm about to get, get right over somewhere I don't need to be messed with tonight. We're talking about the blood of Jesus. And, <laughs> and I, anyway. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1, we'll just start there. Then verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, but the, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded. And the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. In other words, there are things there. That, you know, understand, I believe Paul wrote this. Um, there are those, and, I, and, you, and that's not, a, you, you're not going to go to hell if you believe Paul didn't write it. I mean, and I'm not going to make heaven if I believe he did. I just believe he did. I believe it's part of the revelation he had. He couldn't speak right now in particular, in other words, in detail about the mercy seat, what he saw. Paul said, I knew a man above, uh, uh, above 13, about 14 years ago, whether in the spirit or out of the spirit, I cannot tell. Such a one was called up into the third heaven and heard things. Remember what he said when he wrote this? And heard things unlawful to be uttered. 
whether in the spirit or, or whether in the body or out of the body, I'm sorry. Well, I cannot tell. Now, most scholars believe that's when he was stoned and left for dead, that he, that he did die. He went up into the third heaven, saw all these things, came back, was raised up from the dead, and then his epistles brought all the revelation that he saw in the Spirit on that day. And he was able over time to bring revelation concerning who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, what belongs to us in Christ, what takes place in redemption. And that's why the epistles are so important to the church. Amen. You know, in other words, he brings revelation to our spirits and how to walk out and live the way God designed for man to live. Amen. Uh, verse 5, and over at the cherubims of glory we shall in the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second tent, or holiest of holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make the um, make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washing and cardinal ordinances opposed on them until the time of the reformation but Christ now here is your antithesis now here here's your thesis there is a temple it represents heaven it's laid out in natural order according to how heaven looks in spiritual order the, the priest, all the priests could go into the second, I mean into the first, but into the second went the, the high priest once every year by himself, not without blood, to get a covering for him and the people. Amen. And it was a signification that as long as this temple stood, man could not be back in the original spiritual temple. Okay. But being come a, a, a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more per, which greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. It's not earthly. Jesus is the high priest of the heavenly tabernacle. Now remember, when you read, if you if go back and read your epistles, not your epistles, your gospels uh, of the crucifixion of Jesus, that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was written twain, or written two, from top to bottom. Now Josephus says that that, 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 that was about 20 foot high and about 40 foot wide, and I, I think somewhere, depending on who you're listening to or who you read after, uh, somewhere between four and six inches thick of woven material. How many of you ever tried to take a pair of jeans and tear them? Not down the seam, just rip, just rip the jeans. And they are a quarter inch maybe thick. So let's go four inches of woven, we mean woven material. There was no seams in it, it was all woven. Take four inches of paper and try to tear it. Hello? Now, I'm not talking about four inches of, of sheets, sheets of paper. Take and where they cut four inch, a four inch slab of paper. I'd like to see, I'd like to see the uh, power team do that one. Because what the part of it is they get, they get they, the, the papers are all fluffed and ruffled. They get a little bit here, a little bit here. Take a four inch hunk of paper and cut it and, and tear it in half. Why? Because it, it's wo it's, it is kind of a woven type way that paper's made. Especially if, it's, if you get um, a classic your classic papers, that classic linens and that stuff that have actual threads in it. It, I mean, to tear, you, you grab a stack of paper like this and try to rip it. It's, it's almost, take material, let's just go to the low end, four inches thick, and tear it in half. Can be done by man. It's a supernatural event. And from top to bottom, the Holy Ghost grabbed it at the top, tore it in the bottom. Amen? What? The Spirit of God moved out of the earthly tabernacle. God was no longer going to be housed in tabernacle, a building made with the hands of men. Amen? But notice it says here, he became, listen, everything that we see about the priesthood and the natural, Jesus did in the spiritual when he went into heaven. 
Remember when Mary got him outside the tomb and said, Clut, he said, clutch me not. The King James says, touch me not. The Greek literally says, clutch me not. For I have not yet ascended to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. Go and tell the, the, the disciples and, and, and Peter. Amen. Remember that? Hallelujah. And um, he was on his way to take his blood not into just the outer court, but into the very mercy seat of God and place his blood on that mercy seat. Now, here's, here's, here's a symbolic, and, and I know we're getting over into tabernacle stuff right now. One of the symbolisms here is this. Man's authority. Remember, remember when we read in, in the book of Job, there was a day that the sons of God came before the throne of God? Where'd they come to? They came right where the mercy seat was. Why? Because that's where man's authority was. Man's authority, God gave man authority in the beginning up to, but not including his throne. In other words, right up to the mercy seat where man's authority was. That's why it had to be cleansed with blood. The throne of God did not have to be cleansed with blood. Why? Man's authority never, never, never existed there. It was just, a, just below God. Man never had the authority of the throne of God. He was right below it. And when Adam committed high treason in the Garden of Eden, <clears throat> Satan then had access, because he gave it over to Satan, Satan had access to come right up to the throne of God and challenge God, accuse the brethren. Hello. He had had access. See, we're talking about spiritual matters here we don't understand. But Jesus' blood's now been placed on that mercy seat. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So even if Satan comes to accuse, the blood of Jesus stands between him and the Father. Hello? Y'all here, you're going home. It's because he says here in verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into that holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Actually, says, in the Greek says eternal redemption. For the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, which is external, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God that is internal. Now let me say something here. Notice it says that he obtained eternal. You've got people who go and say, once you're saved, I always say based on, on sometimes this one verse. It's eternal redemption. Now redemption is eternal is eternally secured, is eternally placed, but you can choose to get in or out of it. In other words, what God has established with Jesus Christ is eternal. Your moving in or out of it is up to you. Does that make sense? You got people who run off and building doctrines on eternal security based on the fact that, so, but remember the covenant was made between God and the man Christ Jesus. Not between, it's not between God and Karen. It's not between God and Bill, the father. It's between God and Jesus. When you receive Jesus as Lord, you become in Christ. You become hidden in him, and the covenant that's between him and the Father now applies to you. But you can move out of that relationship with Jesus. And then it no longer applies to you, although it is eternal with God the Father and God the Son. It never changes. And it is an eternal redemption. Are y'all with me here? Am I losing anybody? But those who want to purport an etern you know, eternal security, uh, when one preacher preaches, you know, you become a prisoner of salvation. Once you're saved, you're a prisoner of salvation. There is nothing you can do to ever get out of it. You made a choice to get in, but you can't make a choice to get out. You are now the prisoner of salvation. Of course, there's no terminology in the Bible like that. Where are they making it? Where are they getting it from? They made it up. People make stuff up. I'm telling you. The more we go down the road, the more I look at it, I go, people are just making stuff up. The Benjamin generation, five different anointings. He made it up. They made up the Joshua generation stuff. There's no teaching on the Joshua generation in the Bible. What was that? It was all the, and everywhere it was taught, the young preachers all rose up and split churches. Everywhere it was taught, back, back in the early 90s. Everywhere that Joshua generation teaching was taught, they just started tearing up churches and splitting churches all over the place because they were the young whippersnapper anointed ones who were going to take over and run everything. The old, old geeks had to get out of the way. 
But if you're going, if you're going to follow about, if you're going to teach about something from the Bible as a allegory or as an example, then follow it. Joshua was 80 when he took over. And all the 20 year olds thought they were Joshua. No, 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 no. You might, you might be an up and coming Joshua, but you got another 60 years to put in. Follow the Bible. Bill, Brother Bill. Amen. Thank you. All right. I need a hearty amen. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Bill. Thank you. All right. Jesus entered in to obtain an eternal redemption. And for us, was added by the King James translators. They're not even in the Greek, so it just says he attained eternal redemption. Who is it for? It is for us when we're in him. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Which is kind of taking us to our next point is the reality of the new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old thing, but where are you? In Christ. In Christ. In Christ. How did you get into Christ? By a confession of faith, accepting his lordship. But if you renounce his lordship, and, and, and listen, you can't read Hebrews 6, 1 through 5 or 6 and go, you can't, fall, you can't become apostate. It's... You can't do that. If Verse 4, if it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. This is not a sinner who just went to church a few times. Have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. What does it say here? Verse 4. It is impossible for them. And he lays out a, a list of things. They were enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away. To renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. I don't know how you can read that and go, you can't lose your salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's great, there are great, con I mean, gr um, um, very specific conditions under which this happens. But you can't go around and teach everybody that, you know, you guys say it don't matter what you do. You can't teach that. And I'm going to tell you something, you can't live in faith if you're doing that. Why? Sin forts faith. Sin is an underminer to faith. Why? Well, we read back over in Hebrews verse chapter 9 that the blood of Jesus purges our conscience from dead works to serve. Let's go with me if you will. Hold your place over there in Hebrews 9. Um, and run with me if you will please over to 1 John I believe it's in chapter 2, but let me find it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking it's 4. I'm, uh, where is it? I am looking for the one that says, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Is that Romans? Now, and what's what we ask? If we ask in his name, we, we have it because that's Philippians, isn't it? Who knows what that is? It's not my notes, and that's why I'm kind of like, <laughs> sometimes you get up here and get, you know, get, kind of get... <laughs> That's what I'm after. There we go. There it is, right there. I got it, and I got it highlighted. So it's highlighted in pink. And this is the confidence that we have in Him if we ask anything according to His will. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
he heareth us, and we know that he heareth, that he heareth us. What shall we ask? We know we have the petition. Now, that's not, that's, that's a parallel, that's a companion verse to what I like to teach on this. There's, there's another place that says, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence towards God. Anybody know what that is right off? I wish I, I, wish I had it right, I wish I had it in my notes, I would. And we know he heareth us. Let's see here. We know he, okay, if we ask anything according to this way, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, we ask, we know we have the petitions we desired of him. But the one about, is it, is it, is it Romans 12? And that's still not what I'm looking for. All righty. I hate it when that happens. I'm going to start bringing the computer up here. Huh? Or iPad, yeah. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. All right, we'll just, we'll just, I really need that. Because it's you know the, the scripture that says, if we if if um if our heart condemn us not, then then we have confidence toward God. Yeah, then I, see, I like to kind of tie it with this verse because this is the confidence that we have. We ask it. See, when your heart's not when your heart is not condemning you, you can have confidence, and this is the confidence. There we go. <laughs> there it is. Look here. Look here. Look here. That's I, I, I thought it was, that's not highlighted in my Bible. <laughs> Hereby we know the truth. Verse 19, we are the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ, love one another as he gave commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in. And listen, you can understand this. Now I'm going to tell you something. There are people going around teaching, and been teaching for years, that the only commandment we keep is the commandment of love. And if we love God, love one another, that's all we got to do. And yet the, there are other things in the Bible that God tells us to do. As a matter of fact, here it tells us where to believe on him. Hello? That's part, you got to understand things in the context of which they're written and why they're written make certain, you pull them out and start teaching a, a, a overgeneralized teaching from it and you get to error. If our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Verse chapter 5 verse 14 says, and this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will. What happens if your heart condemns you? There's no what. What happens if your heart condemns you? There's no confidence. And if you ain't got any confidence, you ain't got no faith. Hello? I knew it was in 1 John. So, boldness, faith. Boldness, yeah. But I like it. Outspokenness, because but faith speaks. Yeah. Faith speaks. The Greek says that it means outspokenness, assurance, boldness. Yeah. So if our heart condemns us not, then we have outspokenness. We have boldness. We have assurance. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Brother Bill has Android out. My, my iPhone does the same thing. <laughs> Just want you to know that. There you go. And whatever we ask. Why? Because our heart condemns us not. I am telling you my brother and my sister, for someone to lie to you and tell you you can live in sin and not have your heart condemn you, they're trying to get you to placate it with a soulish revelation that it doesn't matter, I'm under grace or I'm under this or I'm under that. When your heart the whole time yeah. Yeah. is telling you something's wrong and 1 John 1, 9. Think about this. This is all based, comes after 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins, and to, I mean, uh, to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
what happens once you've been cleansed from you're forgiven and cleansed there's no condemnation in your heart Romans chapter 8 hold your place here I know you, know, you got people whose big, who's big thing, and this, and this is one of the, Greek, the big faith grace preacher's points, is that Romans 8, 1, who walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit, was not in the Greek. It's not in the minority text. It's in the majority text. There are two sets of Greek texts in which they derive the translation, the, proper, the, the modern day translations from. The King James, the original King James was based on the majority text text. And if you go do a little research and study, the majority text is the most widely accepted historically with uh, more um, historical evidence and referencing and um, what's the word we're looking for? Uh, authentication versus the minority text. You read the minority text and it'll actually, in some places, if you read it and, and, and you, you go do a comparative study, you'll find that there's almost places it denies the deity of Jesus. Okay, all, all of the modern day texts are based basically on the revised version, which is based on the minority text, the, even the Amplified. Now, the, what the Amplified Bible did is it put into it a bunch of the majority text, but it italicized it in the, even in the Amplified Bible. So, you have to be careful when you go study. Romans 8.1 in the minority text, it says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and that's all it says. Because it says, what is it? and they say it was, a, it, was a, it was a transfer glitch because the end of verse 4 says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Do you read Paul's writings? Paul was rhetorical and, and would reiterate things over and over again. Okay? But let's just read it the way these boneheads want to make their point because they want, to, they want to be able to quote Romans 8 1 without the last half of Romans 8 1 in it. Okay? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's it. I'm not condemned. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son, the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of God might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It don't matter where you put it, it's saying the same doggone thing. He's saying that the righteousness of God will not be fulfilled in you if you walk after the flesh. Well, so whether it's in verse 1 or verse 4, it's there. And it's, and it's all the same thought, and it's all, you just don't separate. You don't pull Romans 8, 1 out and pull out the first part. There's no condemnation to those in Christ. Woo, praise God. Don't matter what I do, I'm not condemned. Let me say this. God may not be condemning you, but your own heart will. And if your heart condemns you, then you don't have confidence toward God. And if you don't have confidence toward God, you don't get what you ask for. You can't have faith to live in sin. Amen. Amen. We're talking about living, about living in the highest kind of faith. If you want to live in the highest kind of faith, you have to stop sinning. Well, how do I stop sinning? Thank God for His empowering grace that when I look to Him and trust in Him and go to His Word, He empowers me to live above sin. I don't go, oh, Jesus paid the price, and I just look at what Jesus did, and I won't sin. Hogwash. What do you mean, well, hogwash? You can't sit around and go, Jesus paid the price, I don't sin. No, no, no. You do as Word says. You follow the teachings of the Word. Flee fornication. You don't stop in the middle of an opportunity to fornicate, and, you know, and go, Lord, I'm looking at you. You run out like David did. You flee. Hello? Oh, we just sleep in the same bed together, butt naked, but we don't fornicate. Yeah. I had some talk by him one time. Yeah, yes, yeah. The Bible says don't, don't give occasion to the flesh. Right. New Testament says make no provision to the flesh. Right. Amen. Here, Paul says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't, I, and I'm just going to read it. It's King James has it, because that's from the majority text. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Because you can, let me say this. Since that statement is after verse 4, you could put it at the end of every one of the previous verses. Because all one thought, and you know how, how language works. Let's say this. Verse 2. 
For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 3, for we walk in the, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the light of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, for those who walk not after the flesh, but in the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? This is all one thought. This is not, you can't, you can't segregate these thoughts and then go out and build something on a segregated or a, 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 a thought lifted out of its text and context to state something. We're talking about having uh, the highest kind of faith, living in the redemption of Christ, living in the redemption of the reality of, of, of being in Christ. And if you're going to do that, you cannot walk out to the flesh, but you're going to have to walk out to the Spirit. Why? Because your heart will condemn you when you're in sin. But we've got people trying to teach people to override their conscience that's telling them you've done wrong, repent, by saying repentance is not for the believer. You're under grace. This is the danger. You're training people to deny the conscience that God gave them to bring them to repentance so they can stay reconciled to God and they can stay in the flow of God and they can stay <coughs> where the heart doesn't condemn them and so they can live in the highest kind of faith. When you say repent, and He is faithful and just. Oh, thank God. You don't have to go do penance. You don't have to go ahead and cut yourself. You repent to God, forgive me. Yeah. Yes. Glory to God. Now the New Testament says that godly sorrow worketh repentance. Where does that sorrow take place? In your conscience. But we've got a whole movement on the planet right now and in churches that are trying to teach people to deny their conscience. Sear their conscience against sin, or actually it's not even against sin, sear their conscience against the voice of God and sear it to sin and still believe that whatever they ask Him, they'll have. When the Word of God says, now hold your place in Romans 8, we may come back there, run back over to 1 John chapter 3. If our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. Hallelujah. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do. Not just His commandments. Did you know what says? He said, keep those commandments and do. Those things that are pleasing in his sight. Wow. God gives us your conscience. Now, I know Hebrews says that he, 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 to cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve him. The blood of Jesus cleanses your conscience from dead works. Look, look what 1 John, let's, oh, can you hold your place here in 1 John and run over to Hebrews chapter 9 again. Can you do that? Not that far away. Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? If our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask. Now let's look at 1 John chapter 1. Flip, kind of holding all these places. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where does the cleansing take place in the believer? According to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. In his conscience. His conscience is purged and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Y'all hear? You understand what I'm talking about? His conscience is cleansed from the remember. Why? Because God knows in order for you to live by faith, and He demands to live by faith. Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. 
But we do know that if your conscience is condemning you, you do not have confidence toward God. And if you do not have confidence toward God, you can't ask of God. And you can't receive of God. You cannot live by faith if your conscience condemns you. So, we've got people who are in an attempt to get people to feel better and have confidence, cause them to deny their conscience's dealing with them to repent about something when they've done wrong. You should be sorrowful that you displeased and dishonored God by sin. But then let the cleansing take place of that. Why? Because godly sorrow worketh repentance and brings us to a place where we come before the Father. And then we, and then we do what? Um, Hebrews chapter something or another. A Romans chapter or something. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne. Hebrews 4, verse 16, let, ver, verse 15. We have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses. Do you understand you still live in a, in a mortal body? But was in all points tipped like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help at the time of need. When you sin and sorrowful repent, see, we don't run from, and this is the beautiful thing about the redemptive plan of God, is that when we do sin and we do miss the mark and we do fall short, we don't have to go hide like Adam in the garden from God. God's grace has made a way for us to come with boldness to his throne to receive the cleansing in our conscience and, 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 and of all unrighteousness so that we can once again have confidence towards him. We don't have to go and hide. We can come with confidence. We can come to the throne of grace and get the mercy and the grace to help in that time of need so that we can receive the forgiveness and the cleansing so that once again our heart doesn't condemn us and then we can ask of God and we can receive of God and we know that we get from him the answer we have need of. Amen. Now it took us the whole time to get here to this last 15 minutes, but that was worth coming to church for. <laughs> Amen. Y'all here, you gone home. That was worth coming to church for right there. That last 15 minutes was worth being here for. Hallelujah. Y'all got it? Amen. That's good stuff. And see, what, when the people are trying to teach some of the stuff they're trying to teach, they think they're helping people overcome condemnation. You can't overcome the internal condemnation until you deal with what's causing it. And it's not preaching on sin. That's the problem. Now, are you preaching on sin? Then you, you, you condemn people. No, 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 no. It's not that. It is not dealing with the sin. If you'll deal with it biblically, your conscience will be cleansed. And when your conscience is cleansed, you have confidence toward God. And when you have confidence toward God, you can ask of God. And when you have confidence, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that whatever well, we ask according to his will, he heareth us. And we know, we're going to go over 1 John chapter 4 further over, and we know if he hears us, we have the petition we desired of him. And it all goes back over here. Knowing who we are in Christ, knowing that we're in Christ, and what to do. First John was put in the Bible as a, if, you, if this happens, here's what you do. If any man sin, if any man sin, if, uh, you know, or, 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 or let's say, if we confess our sin, amen? Before that, it says if, any, if we say we have no sin, we just say, if you've never sinned, you've never sinned, you're a deception. Truth is not in us, Amen? Verse 6 says, that if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not truth. What's darkness? Walking in sin. <coughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. But if we say, if we confess our sins, 
And we've said this before, you can't go get a sinner and tell him to confess all his sins. He can't do it. There's no way. Are y'all here? You're going home. You can't confess all your sins before you get saved. You don't know them all. You probably did stuff at six years old you, sh you, you shouldn't have done. How many can remember some stuff you did way back that you, you forget about? Okay. Chapter 2 says something interesting in 1 John. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. <clears throat> and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. And we can, go, we can just go right on and read, and read we can read this whole, chat, whole book. This, this is the beautiful thing here. If you don't teach this side of it, then this, this does become a problem. The Word of God teaches us not to sin. The Word of God teaches that sin becomes an inhibitor to your living by faith. The Word of God teaches that sin separates you in fellowship with the Father. The Word of God teaches us that if you continue living sin long enough and don't ever repent, don't ever deal with it, it can, it can cost you your salvation in the end. It's, it's plain. But John says, I'm not writing this to condemn you. I'm writing it to help you not sin. And if you do sin, we've got an advocate. Oh, what, a, what beauty in the Scripture. That when God says don't sin and tells you how not to sin and what to do if you do sin, and then if you do sin, Jesus is on your side. Praise God for it. I said praise God for it. Advocate. We got a lawyer. Hallelujah. What's his, what's his, what's his, all, what is the argument of Jesus every time you come to the throne of grace to receive forgiveness for something you've done? My blood's on the mercy seat. End the case. You come, there it is. And the Father always accepts it. He never turns you down. He doesn't go, no, I'm not going to receive it this time. Bill did it four times too many. Never get that answer. Every time you come and say, Lord, forgive me for our sin. You know, I want to get that under the blood. Jesus says, Father, there's the blood. The Father says, accept it. Boom, you're forgiven. You go away with what? Your conscience cleansed, your confidence restored, asking and receiving of God, living by faith. But Satan has brought a deception that is undermining people's ability to live by faith. And all they think they're doing, they're running around thinking they're living under grace and they're just blessed no matter what they do. And they are just so deceived. They're so deceived. It's going to cost them. Because what a lot of people think is living by faith is living by the works of the flesh and they're calling it faith. There's a lot of people who bought cars and called it faith. And, 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 uh, and I'm, I, I beg to differ. Their faith car is now a money toilet. Hello.